Good morning. Some of you are thinking, my goodness, Paul got so old overnight, he looks like Larry Huff. <laughs> Not so. For those of you who uh, don't know why Paul is not here, uh, Naomi has some heart issues, uh, and he took her to the hospital this morning, called me about 8.15. And uh, so uh, the Lord provides. We will carry on. We will have uh, church just as we always have. But I want to take a moment right now and pray for Naomi. Almighty God, we have much faith in what you have done, what you are doing, what you will do, what you have said, or the Christ you have sent. And we build on that faith each day. Today we pray for our sister Naomi, that the hard problems that she's having might be taken care of by those that you have appointed in the medical field. We know you can touch her and heal her. We also know that you have prepared people who can do that. So we pray, our Father, that uh, Naomi will be healed and that uh, she and Paul will return to us soon. And we thank you in Jesus' name. So obviously uh, the screen is not correct. Today's message is not from Ephesians. But everything else uh, seems to be the same. I would make one change. The next to last line, you notice, says, leave your tithes and offerings in the plate by the entrance. The Bible says the tithe belongs to the Lord. So we should say, leave God's tithe and your offerings in the plate. I realize some of you might think that's a technical thing, but it's more than technical. It's the basis of what God had to say to us. When we become a Christian, we belong to him, and everything we have belongs to him. I'm not saying we have to give everything. There is a man, uh, some of you may have heard of him years and years and years ago, that's one advantage to living a long time. You remember things from way back. I remember a man by the name of Laterno. Some of you might have, might have remembered him. He uh, manufactured and sold large earth-moving equipment. He was an extremely wealthy man. He gave 90% of what he earned to the work of the Lord. 90%. And you can say, well... If he was a billionaire, 10% was pretty comfortable to live on, right? You know, what Nancy and I make are pretty comfortable to live on. It's not in the billions, but uh, God provides. That's what he's doing this morning. That's why we're all here. That's why we know that uh, things will progress and uh, Amy will be, or, uh, Naomi will be healed and uh, we'll be back at it. So uh, from here on, uh, let's stand and uh, read our responsive reading. That's not it. Can you click that thing on? There we go. Let's try this one. Come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come. Buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my Lord. My ways, declares the Lord. Let's remain standing as we sing a doxology.
Please be seated. I think uh, normally we stand for one song and sit for another. Let's just sit for both of them. How about that?
Paul is going to preach from uh, the first chapter of Ephesians this morning. And I chose a verse from that passage uh, for uh, actually the second chapter, uh, verse 10 for our communion meditation. It reads as follows. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good work, which God in advance for us to do. And in accordance with that, I think uh, it ties in from 2 Corinthians 5.17 where the Apostle Paul wrote, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So we come here this morning we're looking older, but we're new. We're a new creation. The Bible also says we put on Christ. I'm not really sure what that means. I could read a lot of commentaries and some smart guy could tell me what that means exactly. But uh, I think it simply means that we become more like him. That uh, he chose us. The Bible also says, Jesus said, I chose you, you did not choose me. And so we come each Sunday morning because we are new creatures in Jesus Christ. And we remember the reason we are is because he died on a cross. Not because the Romans put him there, not because the Jews demanded it of Pilate, but because from the foundation of the world, God knew his son would die for us. So let's begin first with the cup. Excuse me, the red. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, he blessed it, broke it, and said, this, my body, is for you. As often as you eat it, do it in remembrance of me. So let's eat together the body of Christ. Then after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together the blood of Christ.
Ephesians 1, again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons to himself through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace, which he graciously bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Christ, which are in heaven and on earth. Psalm 139, 14. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and my soul knows that very well. Father, we see ourselves and others through tinted glasses, not as we are, but as we think we are, and often wish for something you did not plan for us. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known. We know you are perfect and all your works are wonderful, but we doubt the wisdom of what we are and what others appear to be. Help us to trust you and your intentions for us. Guide us to follow your will. Lord, we are 20 years from the attacks of 9-11-2001. We know there's been no incident in the history of the world that surprised you. Teach us to trust and to seek you and your plans in the prophecies in your word that we may be comforted and not afraid, ready to stand with confident faith, faith against all that Satan tries against us. We pray for our country, our leaders, and our military, as well as for our church and ourselves. Lord, we pray for those who grieve, those who are in pain, those who are in fear, those who are in need, that your will will be done. Timothy 2.12 says, For I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Lead us, Lord, and deliver us. Guide us and give us your courage, for we are not able to stand without you. Father, we commit each of your children here and around the world into your hands, and thank you for your ever-present and eternal love. In Jesus' name we pray. And all the people said, Amen. The message this morning is entitled, Created for Good Works which tied in exactly with what I just said in the communion meditation. Our background scripture is taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sign, which the bush does not burn, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have 
Indeed, seeing the misery of my people in Egypt, I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and spacious land, a, man, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of God, you will worship God on this mountain. Have you ever been on a committee? I'm sure all of you have. Something while we were employed, we look forward to <laughs> a committee meeting. Usually nothing was done, but a lot was said. I used to enjoy them, actually, because uh, for some reason uh, I made comments that were not really appropriate, uh, but uh, they did waken people up. So, uh, But many of us uh, have done that, assigned to do a job as a group. Imagine that uh, God has chosen all of us to uh, pick a special leader. Uh, he'll have to lead a group of slaves out of Egypt. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, does not want them to leave. After all, they number over two million, and they've been slaves for him for many years. So who do we choose? How about a great military leader? Remember after World War II, General Eisenhower was the leader and became president. Or maybe a skilled politician. Or possibly an orator who would give great speeches and motivate people. Would you choose a man like Moses? Are you kidding? He's 80 years old. He was wanted for murder in Egypt, the same place we need to send him. Sure, he was well educated, but that was 40 years ago. He was well connected politically, but that too was a long time before. So we did not recommend Moses to God as our committee decision. But God chose him anyway. So much for the committee report. Hmm? Sounds familiar though, doesn't it? That was many centuries ago. God chose what, as we read the Bible, we would see as an unlikely candidate. Today, God has the gospel of Jesus, and many of need are in need of hearing it. Would you choose a super saint for that mission? Or maybe a God would ordain a few angels to get the job done right. He surely would not send a bunch of old sinners saved by grace to tell other sinners about that grace. But God looked around and decided that saved sinners made the best candidates for his work. He hadn't changed his mind. He saved every one of us for his glory. As we read in Ephesians 2.10 earlier, for we are God's workmanship, called in Christ Jesus to do good works. But when we realize he's talking about us, the excuses begin to fly. Remember, that's the first thing Moses did. 
Excuse one, excuse two, excuse three. He had some good ones. But the same problem Moses had is, is what we have. God uh, handled them the same way he will handle ours. Let's look at what Moses told God about the task he was picked to handle and how God handled Moses. Moses said he was a nobody. Now, first of all, Moses went to Egypt as a baby. He didn't go there. He was born there. He went there in his mother. And so he was trained. He was educated. He was military leader. Uh, but after 40 years as a shepherd, he considered himself a nobody. I read somewhere where God can use a nobody to make them a somebody. But it's difficult to pick a somebody who thinks they are somebody. But he felt he was unqualified to go to Pharaoh. But don't we feel the same way? Someone else is better qualified. And I have no ability to get the job done properly. But remember, God chose us. As I said before, as Jesus said, I have chosen you. You did not chose me. If we say we can't do the job, we're saying God doesn't know what he's doing. When Moses came up with the excuses, God said, I will be with you. So he knows we can accomplish the task through his power. As we read in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, I can do anything through him who gives me strength. Amen to that. And we are never sent alone. In Matthew 28, 20, Jesus said, I am with you always to the very end of the age. That was the summation of the Great Commission that Jesus gave just before he sent it back to heaven. And we read in Deuteronomy 31, 6, For the Lord you had goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. When we say we have no ability, but through the power of God, we can do anything. Excuses, one shot down. But that did not slow down Moses to run from God's choosing. So he said to the Lord, I don't know enough about who you are. We might use the same excuse because we don't know enough about God, his word, the gospels and more to get the job done. God told Moses that he is the I am, or just do as I say and I will show you who I am as you need me to. If we've been a Christian for many years, and, and most of us have been, and don't know much about God's word, the Bible, whose fault is that? Through the years, we have had several small group sessions on many books of the Bible, those being from both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I'm sure that before we moved here, we had a lot of Bible studies and preaching in Sunday school from a young age. The contemporary language in the message has this to say from Ephesians 3.20. God can do anything you know far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. Noah probably didn't feel adequate beside that ark. And David had the same feeling next to Goliath. All through the Bible, God's people have felt inadequate next to their obstacles. But God's power working through them, they could overcome, and he will do it for us. Finally, Moses was convinced the Israelites would not believe him if he told them God had spoken to him. After all, they had been in slavery for 400 years and had not heard from God. They knew about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, 
and the promise God had given them about a great nation and the land flowing with milk and honey. They also knew this section of Egypt was not the land of promise. If God had promised so much through Abraham, why were they living in slavery to a nation that did not know God? An obvious question. So their unbelief was well founded in spite of the fact that God told Moses he had heard the cry of the children of Israel. God assured Moses the people would believe him as he worked through Moses until the people realized that Moses' story was genuine. Aren't we sometimes afraid that people will not accept our witness of the way Jesus has changed our lives? We just have to read again what was written in 2 Corinthians 5.17. And I repeat from the communion meditation. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Christ dwells in our heart by faith. One commentary makes this statement. We look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are eternal. Therefore, old things or passed away. As Christians, we have a daunting task. There is a world that we live in that is dying, that is consumed by sin. We don't go to those people saying, look at me, I'm perfect, do you want to be perfect? The Bible tells us that we cannot be perfect. We might live a perfect life up until one point, like a lady that uh, I recall from years ago who said that uh, she had never committed sin. And I thought, well, bless your heart. Now you bragged about it, which I think is a sin. But how many times have we given opportunity and failed to speak up? That's the task that God has before us. That's what Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel, tell them everything I've told you, and as I said before, I'll be with you, even to the end of the world. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing song. God bless y'all.